a little late, but. Uh, Can I have uh, uh, a word before? Yep. Um, <coughs> before we start this presentation, a few words uh, about uh, C.V. Jacobson, who is working with now Aurobelian, who lives in Aurobel, and for many years she was visiting and staying in Aurobel. Uh, she is my wife, by the way. And um, in Norway, she is doing work of consultancy. It's a very unique uh, system which you can't find anywhere in the world. <coughs> and she will explain what it is. Why Norway is one of the best countries in the world to live because of this specific city of Norway, what they do there for their people, how they manage their businesses, how they manage their uh, working environment. They look at work as an environment for people to be integrated and to be socializing rather than to be, you know, earning their living. It's a very different approach, and it is becoming more and more human-oriented society rather than market-oriented only. And not only that they have the biggest fund in the world, more than a trillion dollars of the oil fund, uh, which they earned over years, but also they didn't use this money for the development of their system. Can you imagine? The money is separate. It's just only a, a warranty for their development. So, in a way, for this small country, which is only five million people, uh, with a huge land and very difficult to manage infrastructure because it's to the far north, and if you see how this were, uh, the roads and everything is being managed, it's really amazing that to the farthest village you have a proper road. You know, somewhere a few people live in the, in the far north, and uh, on the on the islands you have so many bridges to come and so on and so forth. That shows the care for the social care. So we are dealing with a new system we never heard of or never dreamed of. So I want you to look at it as a possibility, maybe, for something what we call integral management and what we want to develop as integral management. Not only on the basis of yogic thinking, but also social thinking. What you can do on the ground without going too much into the, the sky. You know? Because we are all in the sky and on the ground nothing is done, or very little is done. So, uh, with this introduction, I welcome uh, Sylvia Jacobsen to give her presentation of her office, in which she works for more than a decade, and uh, about this unique experience. Please. Yeah, can you give me a pointer? I have to stand still. Yeah, I will bring it. Yeah. Yeah. I have been working with this for the last 15 years. Before that, I worked with development of home services to elders in a community and built up the model for that. And when I came to this work, it was new. Nobody knew anything. We knew only one thing. We had to create a work life for everybody who want to work, but also are able to work. This means something had to happen in the companies to be able to accommodate people with different backgrounds. We also had a huge influx of immigrants, refugees, which had to be accommodated. We also had an aging work workforce. What they learned was no more necessary. They had to be rehabilitated, so to say, back to the work life. And I had to go out and help these companies. So when I came out, they said, tell me what to do. <laughs> and I said, I have no idea what you're going to do. I don't know the answers. What are you doing? So that's how it started. So it's quite a scary experience, actually. Everybody looks at you, tell me what to do. But we came to a situation where they also understood that we have to do this together. We have to create the way as we go. This is not done before. It's new. 
So, let's go. What I will talk about today is the, is the Norwegian society and the background for this work. It's important because, especially since it's said, well, it's because it's Norway. This could not be replicated anywhere else. I don't know if it's true. It's up to you. Uh, we will look at the project objectives. I will present for you some of the main concepts that we evolved over time. So we can have a peek into what we found. We will also look at the dream of the future. What is it? The project is still going on. What is the dream? What are, what are the potentials if you focus on an inclusive work life? What does it mean, inclusive work life? And some criteria for success we found. And last but not least, how can we begin such a work somewhere else? We have the brochure you see here, working in an IV enterprise, integ um, uh, inclusive work-life enterprise. How does this affect me? It's about the individual and it is about the company and it's clear that we have had a huge work developing material to educate people. So we have several websites dedicated to this. But first, can you, can you first say what is inclusive work life? What is, how it differs from any other work life? Just that, that definition, which is important for us. What is the difference between inclusive and non-inclusive work life? Because I'm sure it's completely new technology <laughs> for us. Yes. If you think about a work life that is not anymore only thinking about its production, and sees the production to be done in a only one way, with the best people possible to find. It is about a work life which can include those that we don't know fully, whether they will produce as much. To include uh, a man from uh, Somalia with no language, with no skills, How, where can we include him? <coughs> where, where, what, where can we find a place for him? An inclusive work life is a work life where we take the workforce we have and we use it. And we take a shared responsibility for the project and for the process. Yeah. First, these are two countries. One is mine, the other is yours. Can you guess who is who? <coughs> well, these personalities from Oro? Hmm? Yeah, these are two countries. One is Norway and the other is India. These are different approaches in India yeah, and Norway. Which is which is India? You have to guess. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> left one in Norway. Yeah, which one is India? Tell me. Right, right one. The right one. Why? Are you sure? You can maybe read directness, indirect, explicit, so people can see maybe. Can you see the words? Do you think? Uh, in the ah, I let you guess. You said the right one. Yeah. Ah. one right. So you think Norway is very formal compared to India? Do I look very formal? <laughs> Actually, you are the formal one. We are casual. Yes. We are on the outer rim of the casual. So it's a huge difference when it comes to this. 
how we approach people, formal or casual. <coughs> I thought this was interesting when I found it, so I took it. And it can also give some interesting, I saw how inclusive work like can give some interesting input to your society. Because I found a survey by Catalyst, they reported. Can you click the Yeah, of course. <laughs> but why did you think that it was right? Can you say a few words? No, no, that's because uh, we thought in a different way. Like enthusiasm when I saw, and then I got to know, no, no, it's, it's the left one again. So. Okay. Yeah, we are, we are, you can but see there are. But the main thing is formal and casual. And um, formality, yeah. Yeah, mainly. But in what, which, which sense it was, we can't be right that which sense was a formal way. Yes, I can give you an example. Yeah. If you are a student in a Norwegian high school, you address your, your teachers with first name. You sit down and you have lunch with your teacher. Okay. This continues into the work life where you address your boss with first name and it's also completely normal to have lunch with your boss. The way we see our managers and directors are colleagues with a little more responsibility. They are colleagues with a little more responsibility. They have to take decisions. They have to do the administrational work because I want my wage, I need my wage. And uh, so, so you are, you are talking about Norway or India? Norway. Definitely Norway. Norway. <laughs> yes. Prime Minister in uh, Holland goes to work Norway. On the bike. Right. She, she takes the bus. She the takes the bus. The king of Norway can go by train. And how do they see their subordinates or the, the working people along? How do they see? How do they see their the subordinates? Bosses. Subordinates? Yeah. yeah. Well, they see us as colleagues. They are colleagues. We are colleagues. We are all colleagues. There's no difference between us. It's uh, also a high degree of, uh, of sharing of the work, so to say. I know everything. I know the budget. I know everything, how the money is spent. We have meetings. I can, it's, we have an open door policy. I can go to my leader whatever time I want. It's never no. Rarely can you wait. Very rarely. Maybe every 25 time. Holding hands with each other, shoulder to shoulder, work together. Yeah, I know fully. Difference. Fully. Yeah. We are, it's, we, everything we do, we do together. Whether you work in a private firm or in an um, um, official. Yeah. And the transparency is also there while working all together. together. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely, that's India. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I agree. clears throat> okay. Uh, I found this interesting to bring because it says, according to the Indian Best Place to Work Institute, reward and recognition is a wide concept and it is increasingly being redefined to include not just traditional ways of thanking and compensating employees, but also newer areas like physical and emotional well-being of people. So India is actually changing towards a more inclusive work life or you want to go in that direction. So, so if you think about this, we can, uh, we can try to see if what we have learned, found, and what we live can be something, uh, something to bring here. Yeah. As I said, it is important 
it is important to look into a little into the Norwegian work life, so to say, Norwegian nation, before we go into the, the concepts, because we need to see why and how we could do this. So Norway, yeah, we became an independent nation in 1814. But we seceded from Sweden only in 1905. But we had a constitution in 1814. So the union was finished. Before that, we had been in union with alternating between Denmark and Sweden since 1380. So we are what you can ca call a uh, quite young individual nation. The population is approximately 5.5 million. Very small. When you look at this, here we are. This is Norway, close to Sweden and Finland. So Norway, Sweden and Denmark are called Scandinavia with Finland on the side. They kind of hang on there. If you look at us compared to the size of England and Europe, we are quite large with a huge coastline. It is, we are known for beautiful, clean nature, spectacular, Aurelia, Aurelia Borealis. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, spectacular, over white snow, shining in the snow, it's really spectacular. We have a beautiful nature, but I am, as Vladimir said, it's challenging for the infrastructure. Look at these roads between islands, thousands and thousands of islands along the coastline. People lived there. It was the main road. For 70 years ago, the people lived on the islands, not on the main coast. So, snow can also be a challenging. It's spectacular and beautiful, but challenging. So infrastructure is hugely expensive in Norway because of this. We have cities, there's one of the closest to us. So it's not only mountains, it's also a little flat here and there. And one of the main productions we have is fish farming. It's a huge industry. So this is a picture from one fish farm. And if you see the small white dot, it's a house on the boat. Three bedroom, control room, living room and kitchen. Then you start to see the, the size. Inside that house is two people. They are running the whole fish farm from there. There comes a boat, a service boat, and do service if needed. And everything is monitored by cameras under sea and above sea. So it's a little workforce needed for this. The rest is bought services from other companies. Marine biolo biologists are following the sea bottom. We have divers this, who do work if necessary. And when they move these huge fish farms. So it's also interesting. And we will come back to why it's interesting. While other countries celebrate their National Constitutional Day with military parade, this is how we celebrate. It's the Children's Day. We dress up in our national customs, eat ice creams and sausage and play games. Adults and children play games. And these are our high school students, third year students celebrating the last year. Two week celebration ending with exam. It's nice, huh? <laughs> Every year they collect a huge amount of money for a, for a good cause. I think this year they collected a huge amount of mon money for the uh, Red Cross and one project there. So it's not that this is a time only for having fun, it's also for fundraising. So many of these already have their businesses because we have business as, um, as a topic at school. Yeah. Um, 
I have to skip a lot of information here, but I can say that the paperclip is invented in Norway because it tells we are solution oriented. That you have to be when you live in a country which is only rock. We didn't have trees before 1950 almost. So we have to use what we have. Um, we are a social democracy. We have a mixed economy. And there is a special cause for that. Uh, as rest of Europe and, Scandina and Scandinavia, Marxism and socialism was active from the middle of the 18th century. And the first labor union was formed in 1882. But it was actually the Second World War that changed Norway most. Even though we became the country in Europe with a socialistic revolution got its strongest grip, it was because it was a, a embraced by the Labour Party, it was still the war that made the biggest difference. I read now because of lack of time. During the Second World War, Nor Norway had a strong and active resistance against the Germans which occupied Norway in 1940. Among the things they did was to sabotage Hitler's projects. And by that, they delayed Hitler's production of heavy water. And some say that's the reason why he didn't invent the bomb first. In the resistance during the war, there was no difference between people. Businessmen and farmers, women and men, fought side by side and learned to respect each other by the total self-giving this work implied. It was actually the brotherhood experience which changed the future politics. Because after the war, the political parties the government and the leaders of the resistant movement collaborated in planning of the rebuilding of the nation. The history is that Hitler, he burned everything in Norway, half Norway, from north and down. Houses were built of wood, it was nothing left. People were living inside rocks and whatever they could find to survive during the winters. It took time to rebuild. They wanted a strong welfare state with high degree of equality between people. Even though the people in the resistance went back to their respective positions and social groups and faced each other as employers and employees, they stood by the decision to create a welfare state where all the resources will be shared and their generation built the foundation for the country to come, become what it is today. Norway is today what is called a progressive welfare state. Norwegian values are rooted in egalitarian ideals and openness. Equality and equal rights are important values. And most Norwegians believe in equal distribution of wealth and that everybody should have an equal opportunity. In Norway, education is paid and as long as you don't have high school, you have the right to finish high school as long as you are not a pensioner. So you can go to high school for free. You have also right to a new education paid on the bachelor level if you are becoming disabled. So we are supporting everybody's ability to develop and to be able to work. We generally have a high degree of trust in the government and believe in the welfare state. Norway is called a welfare state because the government, both federal and local, has primary, primary responsibility for the welfare of its citizens. Everything else has to be second. It is also an established fact that the people with physical and mental and social challenges should have equal rights and be treated with as much respect as other people.
The Norwegian welfare state is mainly and more than 80% financed by taxes and duties paid by its inhabitants and not by oil money, as many believe. We use very little of the oil money. It's in crisis and depressions, the oil money come in and help us build infrastructure. So it could be have a little crisis now and then. It becomes roads and hospitals and schools and homes for elders. The egalitarian values at the root of the welfare state manifest themselves throughout the Norwegian society in many ways. An example of this is a systematic effort made to ensure that women and men are equal when it comes to education and wages. In uh, Norway, you have compulsory papa, pen, uh, per, uh, papa leave when you have a child. You have to stay home for almost three months. And you get the payment your wife should have had. So we are trying to create a society as equal as possible. And it also says something about the participation in the work life. We couldn't do this if everybody participated and brought money to the government. Or not to the government, to the common pot. Did you understand what she said about the leave? Um, that her husband has a right the same as the mother. Three months to stay. He actually a duty. He has to. He has to apply not to. So, belief in equal rights and values is why we have come to a situation today where labor union, state and federation of employers again has come together around the project. We have projects going all the time, but now they are here again. And this is the Nordic model. It's their cooperation, which is, it's not a fight, it's a cooperation. They sit together in the work, work, uh, work environment and they discuss, they find solutions, they don't fight. That's long ago. They only fight if something, somebody is trying to destroy. This is, here we have, it's on the whole level from top to the bottom. If you go to the top, you have the, the king and the prime minister sitting together, together with the labor union leaders. Uh, and the Federation of Employers leaders, leaders on all fronts, are sitting together and taking decisions, which is, a co which is um, uh, affecting the balance between two, these two sides. It's a balance here, which we try to uphold. So the, the opposition of the employees to the employed, employees. Employees on one side with the labor unions, their leaders, and on the other side, employers, those who have companies who run their businesses. <coughs> they have to come in agreement, and the state is controlling that agreement, their relation. We don't have anywhere in the world such a situation that all of them sign the agreement to collaborate, to work together. Norway has the same problem as the rest of the world, an aging population. So, less participation in the work life, more elders, less people to earn money, is why we have this project. <laughs> we have... So the background is that we have a major increase in absence from work due to illness major increase. 20% increase in the 1990s was set off this search to find <coughs> why. 20% increase. They saw also that number of individuals with long-term pensions increased. Less labor for participation rate age above 60. And dropout from high school. It was all signs of things. And a group was formed and, and looked into this for five years, actually. And they couldn't find any answer why it is like this. They said, it's something to do with the whole society. The future looked like this. This is a, 
way of uh, seeing it uh, illustrated because in Norway, as I told you, we pay with our taxes, taxes and duties. We pay the pensions. In the future, it is like this. In 1967, we were 3.9 people working for each person that had a pension. In 2003, it was 2.6 workers paying for one pension. And the future, it's 1.6, which has to pay the pension for one. That's a lot of money if everybody is going to have the same. It doesn't, goes, doesn't work. We know that also one third of jobs will be automatized. All the low skilled work will be automatized, one third. So a lot of the workforce will be set free. We need them in healthcare, we need them to take care of elders. So a lot of rehabilitation has to be made for them to go into this kind of work. And many of those are men. The uh, above 67 group will increase with 40%. So it's much more people to take care of. So of course, the authorities became alert when they saw this. And the work life is already also alert because where shall I find my workers? It's all the only all this year. I need new fresh youngsters. I think it's the problem in entire Europe. Exactly. And we are much better off than the rest of the Europe. Much better off. They have many pensioners per uh, worker. So they don't have a chance then they will have to have uh, much more than we have in oil money. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the picture that we have seen. So a small look, closer look at the project. It's made a memorandum of understanding concerning the more inclusive work life conditions. So we have made an understanding that we all, of the, all employers in, the, in Norway, whether whatever they do, if they work, if it's a pu public organization or a private corporation, all have agreed to this, all have signed for this. So we will increase the working environment and increase return to work. Working environment wasn't mentioned in the first uh, agreements. We didn't see it as a problem. It came only seven years ago. They said, but this has to do with work environment. So it became one of the main objectives. Prevent exclusion and withdrawal from working life. This is what we have to do. And prevent and reduce absence due to work. Due to illness, sorry, due to illness. We have to embrace, as we see with these hands, we have to embrace an inclusive work life. We have to create it. So, to make it easier to measure this, because it has to be measured, we have to reduce sickness rate with 20%. It says more individual reduce function in the workforce. This we see in the work and welfare system where they are registered. And it increase the retirement age with 12 months. This also we see in the system, and that is done. So now we have increased we try six months more. We have been able to uh, have incitements for work, people to work longer. So this is the clear objectives which we measure. So 2001 we had first agreement, 2005 second, and then 10 and 14. And now the, the one we have is expiring in December this year. Now it's discussed, shall we continue? We have a problem with this. We have a huge problem. Because we don't have any unemployment. Who shall we employ? Who are those that we have to employ if they are not to... Where are they? As you see here, Norway is the red one, Germany here, 
Then America is the dark green, Sweden, and the Eurozone. Unemployment rate is low. And we have a problem with the finding workers. My daughter, she is a manager in a shipyard. They employ men from Lithuania, Poland, Czechia, because they can't find Norwegian um, steel workers. Skilled steel workers are very difficult to find. And they deliver boats to Indonesia and the area down here in addition to the Norwegian market. So they talk about maybe we have to outsource a part of the, of the cooperation to Asia because we don't have workers. It's not easy. But when the, when the unemployment is low like this, we can understand that those in these, those here, they are marginal. They have difficulties, most of them, because they all with everybody's registered as, a, as a, um, applying for work if they don't have a pension. Otherwise, you don't get any support. So they are all here. We have all here. When I went into the lists of youth between 18 and 25, I, could, I had such a problem finding any of them I could bring to the, uh, work, um, to the work life. They had psychological problems. They had drug problems. They had uh, social problems. A huge m amount of them had this depression and anxiety. So we understood we have to do a serious work with this, our youth. Uh, since I be uh, begun this work, we have changed a lot. My son is 17. He didn't like school. No, he loves school. He's in high school, second year, and he loves school. He's not away from school one day. It's the best place to be. They have changed things. This is, this is very good. And they measure the, the students' uh, feeling of belonging to the school. They see that the learning abilities goes up. Also, the results goes up and the interest goes up because of the changes they have made. That would be another presentation, what they did. So we, we have, we, this is what we have to work with. So we want to create a work life for everybody who wants and are able to work. This is the vision, which has been all the time. So to improve the working environment, enhance present at work, prevent and reduce sick leave, and prevent exclusion and withdrawal from working life. Exclusion and withdrawal. I could have gone into all these words. In itself, it's a long presentation, what it is about. There are so many reasons why somebody excluded from work. Harassment was something we worked with early in 2000s. Many uh, experienced harassment from <coughs> colleagues, uh, even also from their boss. So that was, uh, was something we enlightened people on. When we come to these individuals, over time we have developed the concept to see them. Where are, what are, what are this, this uh, wood? Of, we saw only trees in the beginning. We couldn't see anything. So we had to try to make a concept that we could perceive with our mind what was happening. So we saw, okay, we have people in work. And then we saw these people have challenges. On one side, they had problem at home. This is typical Norwegian problems, which or pregnancy is not a problem, but pregnancy can mean you can't work. That you have to have a special situation at work to be able to work. And on the other side, we saw that the Norwegian work life was, it's fast changing. In five years, only 10% of the companies are left in an area. The new companies coming up because what they produced is no longer of interest. So restructuring was a huge problem for many.
So to be able to change, when the company changes and you as an individual have also to change, you have to accept the changes. We saw that many fell out because of this. Things were not done well enough. So cope with challenges. We had to increase the employee's ability to cope with challenges. What we saw at work was that if this was a problem at home, they had frequent absence and they were unfocused. Absence could be all the possible absence you can think of. I have had been living with eight to ten uh, Indian men working in my place and I have noticed that it has been a lot of uh, functions. But uh, it, not everything has been functions. <laughs> there have been other things also. So many things can hide big from illness. If you say, I'm not at work because I'm ill, many things can hide there. We know that 50% of the abs absence from work is actually due to substance abuse. They go to a football match with friends and drink alcohol and stay up to 2 o'clock in the night. It's fun. But then it's hard to go to work the day after and then they don't go. So, uh, so th that is also have to do with how close are you related to your work environment? How much are you willing to go to work really? This is typical uh, Norwegian setting, so it can be a little difficult for you to relate to, but I think you should have the facts as they are. 50% is, is due to substance abuse, most alcohol of course, and fun, celebrations, things like this. <coughs> On the other side, we see mood fluctuations at work and making mistakes. These are two very common things. So, we found that the solution is we have to talk with each other and not scold each other or we suspect, suspect each other. We have to talk, to talk with each other. We have to have a dialogue, which is a structured form of exchange. And this particular dialogue, it's about, it's a function assessment. What can you do and what can't you do? The other one is a assessment of the workplace. What do we have of work? What are the work possibilities? And then we have to see what we can, uh, what we go for, and put it in a plan. We write down what the what the work will be, and we call it a we call it a, a contract. It's a preliminary contract. It lasts only for a few weeks, but you have a special ag agreement at work, and you go to activity with this plan in hand. It's made for you, you have the original, and you do your work, and then we talk again and see how it works. The aim is for you to come back 100%. If that is not possible, we have to look into other options. But this is the talk. This is how we see the individual's challenge at work. And this is the way, here, is the way we face it. And this is what we do all over Norway. So we have, wherever you go, Wherever you work, you will have the same process. And it's also connected to a Norwegian system. But we are not alone doing this. I'm not alone doing this, luckily. We have national projects of all kinds, on all levels, from kindergarten to the oldest. So for my work, we have had different uh, sub and support projects. One is, it's silly to have to be reporting sick the whole body if it's only the arm which is painful. To learn to assess yourself and see, can I use myself at work? Another one is, see you tomorrow. These are two colleagues working together. One is saying, would I love to tell you that I'm struggling. On the other sh sh shirt it said, I would have loved to tell you that I know. It's a, it's a, uh, we try to make it normal to have psychological problems. That to struggle is normal. To not struggle is not normal. Then you would be inhuman, or we called it in old times psychopath. <laughs> we don't use the word anymore. 
But this is normal. We all struggle. But if we talk together, it can be better to be with each other. And many feel inferior because they actually struggle and don't know that they have struggle because they are so good at hiding their struggling. And some are not so good at hiding their struggling. But we struggle, all of us. Some early in life, some middle of life, some late in life, some all life. We have also used old models. They have been very helpful. So this is a model. This is Chicks and Mihaly's flow theory. It has been helpful as a research, uh, as a background for research, and also to explain to employers and employees how important it is to have mastery, joy in work, happy and pleasurable balance. When we have the challenges, here, self-assessment of mastery, experience claims uh, challenges and tasks. This is how we experience our work. And this is how we experience our way to handle the work. And for some, they are here. They say, I go to work and I love my work and looking forward to every day. But if you do that every day, or every time of the year, you're high school students. Are you happy it becomes a vacation now and then? Looking forward to another vacation now and then? <coughs> nice. I think the students also think it's nice. It can be hard to be a high school student. In Norway, Norwegian language is killing Norwegian teachers. They always have, they're always tired when it comes to the end of the exams. It's a lot of work for them. So, um, what we found, they used, used this model to do some research, and what they found, this is a Norwegian society. 12% experienced anxiety and stress at work. The work was too challenging, the claims were too high, the tasks were too many or too hard. 50% were in that zone where everything was good or okay. And 38% were bored. So that is actually a good sign since we lose one third of the simple jobs in the future. A lot will be released from this boring zone because many of them have very simple repetitive, repetitive work. But the, 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 still, the number here, this one, is creating a lot of absence from work. This one also, this is more long-term absence. You know, anxiety, stress, related, uh, goes to burnt out, it goes to psychological, real psychological problem and so on. This one creates more struggle and uh, fights at work, so to say. <laughs> So it's different result from this different uh, experience. If it's boring, why don't have a fight with a colleague? It's nice. Have a little life. <laughs> yeah. So we have to look at this, this 38%, this percentage away from job. So we found another model. You know an iceberg? You don't have many of them in India, no? This is one in the sea. So here, this is the top of the iceberg. Oh, you know that um, the major part of an iceberg in the sea is under the sea. Yeah. So here is the line. So if you think that this is the visible absence and presence from work. Oh, it's not much of the iceberg. So what can the rest be? That is what we focus on, no? People have gone or not, that's what we look at. But, look at this. We have an invisible abs absence from work. That is the huge absence from work. That is what you really have to focus on. It's the lack of motivation. Engagement, creativity, competence, mastery, involvement, clear aims, team play, management, Work enjoyment and employship. It's a Nordic word. I don't have it in English. I just translated. 
This is the invisible absence. If you have a class here, you're not motivated. You're not engaged in your work. You don't even feel mastery because these students are like hell. It's a good word for it. They create at least hell for you in the class. You can't do your management and so on. Here is where we lose most. Because the research show the cost originating from absence of engagement is more than the cost linked to medical leave. And that to mobilize a committed mutual interaction around the work task, around the work tasks, lowers the absence from work. So to work together with somebody else is positive. It increases the engagement and enhances the operations. Twenty years ago, in Norway, they only took the paper, sickness leave paper, that's it, finished. And the lack of being seen has been one of the reasons why this has developed. Nobody sees me, so why? And it was, um, it was actually um, uh, a news a few months back about a man in Italy or Spain he was um, working on a, in a dam. They had a huge, uh, uh, they produced electricity. It was a dam and he was an engineer and he was working there. And a case came up. He has been away from work seven years and received his <laughs> wage. And nobody had even asked where he was. It's a good one, huh? So to see people, to know who are your employees, and to follow them up is important. Very important. I saw that the, the Indian railway system were going to get rid of 13,000 workers yes. due to absence from work. But I ask, do the managers see them? I would kick the managers and not the employees, honestly. It's all about management. This is a knowledge we have come up with. Of course. <laughs> Kick the people and keep the managers. Does it become better? OK. So to understand the, the employees and their situation is one thing. The other thing is to see the company. So we have also found some ways to see them. It's not unknown methods it, or unknown thinking, but we have put it into structure. I have made an uh, illustration of it for, for the presentation today, so it's better to understand. Because red, yellow and green, you know, as colors, it's light, red, stop, yellow, made yourself ready, and green, go. <laughs> we want to go. Go is best. But reactive organization, they ident identify illness in the organization and the individual. They tend and cure and they rehabilitate. That's what they do. You go home and you come back when you're ready. That's it. Then we have the preventive organizations. They identify poor health, identify unhealthy factors, and remove unhealthy factors. So they ask questions, why? Why, why, why are you at home? They ask. Is it something with our work environment? They ask. You say, yes. My colleagues are not doing their work and I get all the work. <laughs> that is what they do. They try to check out how things are and prevent the situation. Then we have the promoting organization. They identify health. Health factors. And they focus on what is bringing health and Good days for our workers. That's what's important. They don't want to use time on the other two if they can use it on the third. If we think at the world at large, most of this development of understanding of these three levels came actually with the oil industry. 
because they ha it was dangerous work. You know, they blew up these uh, wells and uh, metal pieces were flying in all directions. A huge pressure from this oil. So they lost a lot of workers in the US. So US started to really work on this problem. Health, environment, and safety became, uh, became um, uh, what do you call it, Vladimir? It became a concept. It became a concept. So deviation. They were looking for deviation. Is everything going as it should, or is something not done right? Deviation. They were focusing on safety, health, environment, and safety. This is health, environment, and safety. Health, environment, and safety, the three factors, which is the whole work environment in one go. But safety, they were focusing on that. Then they understood it doesn't help to just have deviation and repair things. We have to try to prevent. So they started with the risk assessment. Still, it was on this safety. Very little on environment. It wasn't before they started to wake up to the effects on the environment around them with oil and everything, oil spills and so on, that that came. And the last, continuous improvements. You know about lean, Toyota? Lean, it's a method they developed in Toyota, which was focusing on health, environment, and safety, but they focus on this area. It's not the only method, there are many methods. But lean is one of them, and maybe I thought it was the one that was best known in, um, in uh, uh, ES, e East and Asia. Uh, there, everything is taken into account. Health of people, they do everything to keep people healthy. They uh, focus on the environment also. Everything has to be healthy. They even have built a city for their workers, and they have to live there, and they give the children education, and they call it the Toyota family. It's a typical Japanese thing, family. <coughs> you couldn't create a, a fish farming family in Norway. It didn't work. We don't have that. Two people. Two people. <laughs> Even if you were a thousand, it wouldn't work. Family is family. That's it. We don't have any fish farming family. <laughs> but in Norway, we have colleagues. We have, uh, we have the, how to say, we have the commitment to each other, which is super strong in our country. The respect for each other. So we have lean in Norwegian developed lean in Norwegian, not family, but colleagues. So all these three belong together. If you do a deviation and you stop there, you will continue to do a deviation and nothing is happening. Register deviation. If you then do a risk assessment, you say we had a deviation in that area, um, I use you. You didn't come to the class. That's a deviation, because you should have been in the class. Then they do a risk assessment. You say, I'm sick. And then they do a risk assessment. How often will you not come to the class? And you discuss, all of you discuss, what is the history of the last two years? Yeah, OK, six times a year. Yeah, can we live with that? Yeah, we can live with it, but we need somebody to fill in. Every time you are away, because you have this type of, uh, of uh, subjects, it's important that we have somebody to fill in. So the risk assessments uh, define that you behind will be always filling in. Then it's done. Risk assessments are done. And if a dev uh, deviation happens, we have a plan. But if we want to come to the next level, oh, sorry, here, you're not doing this only. We have to improve. We have to make it so you can, you don't need to be away. And you have to work on yourself to be able to come to work. Maybe the reason is high blood pressure. Too high blood pressure medicine doesn't work. OK, forgot to take my medicine. What can you do? It's not my answer. 
but there is always something we as individuals to do because this inclusive work life is about lower is about addressing the gap between the workspace ability to give you work and give you healthy work and your ability to do the work we're going to reduce the gap so that we have a match oh a match full match that's what we want if we can't we have to compensate on each side can you follow me on this Okay, um, yeah, do like this. In Norway, we did have been done some very simple things, which is very, uh, which is very easy to do. We have made routines for follow up of employees on six days leave. They are not left alone anymore alone. They are followed up, and we have bed. We focus on the better the con conditions for inclusion when people suddenly disappear, because this is a deviation, no? Suddenly disappear. This is not a planned or a, something evolving over time. It's more accidents and, and uh, things happening which you don't think about. When we come to the preventive organization, we focus on prevent absence. We have to put the conditions together. We have to work so people don't drop out or are excluded. As I said, harassment has been a huge thing. People are also sensitive to harassment and the feeling of inferiority. Here also, better the requ requisite for inclusion. Word better is not so good, I see now, but you understand what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Increase, the pre increases the better. And here, continuous inclusion in a healthy promoting perspective underpin inclusive practice. This is the thing here, which is most important. And we build up towards this. So the dream. We have, do you have work in environment as surveys? Survey. You answer questions about your work, no? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You also ask questions which is telling the management how you experienced your work, work life. And these are the background for what you do. You don't put them in a drawer, but you do take them for real. If 10 out of uh, 20 say that uh, I'm stressed at work, then it's time to look into the reason for this stress and do something about it because we knew stress can lead to heart disease, drop out from work, sickness leave, psychological problem, and so on, so on. So we have to, that's why we have these surveys, to look into and reduce. Maybe we should open for questions. Do you think it's a good time to open for some questions or some comments? No? Okay, I can. Uh, no. We cannot go on because okay, no. time is up for one hour. Yeah, so I just, uh, then in the end I can, um, can you, yeah. I go first to essential question because I think this is, this is kind of the important. What knowledge, attitudes and skills need an employee to have to be a good employee? What is a good employee? What knowledge, attitude, and skill need a manager to have to be the good manager? And good means that you create a work environment and conditions which supports your development as a good teacher. That you produce good students, good workers for the future. This is what you do. And an essential understanding to be having an inclusive work life is to understand that we are each other's work environment. And that is what all mothers values 
Well, we most probably have been talking about the verities, goodness, gratitude, equality, and so on. If we know we are each other's work environment and we think, how will I want others to be towards me? You know how to be at your at work. So it's a it's a kind of simplistic way of looking at it. Unfortunately, it's not so easy. Even though we know this, we forget. And even though we know this, we are not able to. And even though we know this, the systems doesn't work and support us as we need. We have to develop more than a thinking. We have more than this. Yeah. Then? This is not from Norway, and you see it's so <laughs> It was supposed to be a slow transition towards yeah, this. Very slow, so we can go to the question there. There is a lot of provoking thought. Please, go ahead. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm going to take an example of our environment here. Mm -hmm. The demands are so varied, and they come from so many sources. How do we tackle that? Mm -hmm. uh, when you're talking about work, uh, inclusive work environment, I mean, we can do that in a particular group. I mean, like, take an example of maybe our faculty group. It is able to do it. However, the demands, the requirement from that particular group will come from so many sources. What do you do about that? Because mm -hmm. I personally think the multiplicity of sources of demands <coughs> breaks that group, even if it's, it, it, it happens to be knit together, even if it is working at an inclusive work attitude, it kind of breaks down. How do you handle the, that environment? Mm. Uh, what, what kind of approach would you give to be able to control that and literally control that? And it goes same for managers also. I mean, I, I am at the position of a manager. So I also have that. I, my work standard is all right. I, mean, I know my work has to be this way, it has to be this way. However, the, the requirement, the demands, the standards are extremely varied. And it does stress me out many times. And it has reduced a lot now because I've taken a different approach towards it. However, I still have this question. Yes. How does <coughs> one control that, the outside? First of all, if we go back to the concept of mastery, what we can do is to become better in mastery. That is and what we can... mastery, you mean self-mastery on one's own work? Yes. Related to your work, it's something in this that is happening when the pressure comes to you something happens with you as an individual, as a manager, and those in your group. There are psychological processes going on, and very often this is related, or it's about mastery. You say that the pressure is more than we can master. So we have two fields. One is yours, which is you and the colleagues in your department. The other one is the sources that are pressuring you. If you know as I say, I, I usually say, if I do my best, I know I take the courses, I upgrade myself, I really do my work, and I know I do the best I can, I can handle in tremendously much pressure. But if I am unsecure, I don't have an organization behind supporting me, I don't have the, the uh, resources needed, and so on, I have, I know that something has to be looked into on that side also. So we have to look at the individuals and the group and the organization. And uh, I have also been working with the third part, those that are demanding the services. We have also done that and said that you are demanding more services than we are able to provide. I think the, the question is more difficult uh, than 
we can answer. I don't think there is an answer to this question of the difference in, uh, in the standards <coughs> for coming together. A very similar uh, uh, survey was done in Europe, in the whole Europe, by the organization specially made for this survey, how to improve work environment. And you know, after examining the whole situation, they came with the recommendations after two years of work that we cannot recommend anything. Because the standards, the national, in the factory or in the bakery where there is one Polish, one German, one uh, you know English and one uh, Indian guy, Pakistani, come together, everybody with different standards in education, what can you recommend? You can't really find common ground. You can't find common, you know, <coughs> understanding. Yeah, even not even ground on which understanding can be made. No. So what they recommended is the improvement of individual knowledge and culture. That's it. Individual knowledge and culture. When I read the report, mm. I was wow. That's what she says. Individual development. There is no other way. We have to identify the gap. What is the gap between the demands and what you can deliver, or what is, what is creating the gap? And when we see this, uh, we have to go and see what we can do with it. What can we do on each side of this difficult situation? We, what you said, it creates stress, for indicating if it would be boring. And it's a total different problem but than stress. It's too many. It's too big demand. We have to regulate it. The question is of those that I can uh, say that to uh, increase your ability as, a, as an individual to handle this stress is a very good possibility. It's often very easy to do. It's about thought patterns which has to be changed. Then it's the organization and we'll go into the organization and see how they protect you against this pressure from outside, for instance, is also a thing that can be looked into. But if everybody pressure gives pressure, what's the, there's no use. The result will be according to how well you are able to do your work. Do you do a good work under a total stress? If somebody starts hammering you like this, does that create a good result? No. So that this is kind of more an understanding we have to come to what is creating the best result. And, and uh, they see the concept of work is changing. Yeah? The concept of work is not the same anymore. It's a rather social uh, integration, yeah? a cultural interaction more than she didn't tell you all the, uh, all the uh, things, for example, such thing, if you are not able to work 60%, you can give only 40%. You are still taken by the company, and 60% is covered by her office. Her office pays 60% of your uh, incapacity to work, because it is cheaper for the whole country to have you for 40% and pay 60 than to pay you 100% on medication. So, and then you can recover. You can recover through work environment, through interaction, through social life. You can rebuild your, rejuvenate your energies. This is a new concept of work. Yes. It's not more uh, earning your livelihood. It's more being part of the society. And there are many yes, facts we haven't got in, gone into today. We know that 60% uh, of those being away from work more than three months doesn't come back mm -hmm. to work. And this doesn't have to do with how much money you have and don't have. It's, it's something happening to you is, which is completely uh, takes you away from the ability go back to work. So there are many, many facts found during this. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I think we we'll stop here. Thank you, Celia Kupersen, for this beautiful presentation. And we
we hope to see more of your presentations. There are many more things to discuss in the, the field of education, what is happening in Norway and Finland and so on. And, but this is just the end.